Okay, um, today we're going to study the chapter 19, uh, which is the first law of thermodynamics. And we will cover several topics as listed, um, and we will introduce them one by one. So in this chapter, so most of the uh, contents are just concepts. There are not so many calculations. So uh, it's not difficult. Uh, you don't have difficult equations to remember. You don't have complicated calculations to do. You just need to understand a lot of uh, concepts. I suggest you to read the textbook um, a couple of times and try to understand everything. And sometimes you may need to uh, do some Google search um, sometimes if you search something on Google, either in lectures, on videos, or web pages, um, those will, will be very helpful. Okay, so an introduction. Uh, for example, a steam locomotive operates using the law of thermodynamics but so do air conditioners and car engines. So there are a lot of things designed using the thermodynamics laws. Um, so learning the thermodynamics is very useful and helpful. Uh, let me change the uh, pointer to be pen. And we shall revisit the conservation of energy in the form of the first law of thermodynamics. Actually, we have learned it in a very detailed way. Do you remember uh, I prepared um, a slide for energy and we spent like a couple of weeks on um, the topics of energy, which is beyond um, this book. Um, so as a preparation lecture, I, I have introduced a lot of things for energies. And in the last part of that lecture, it's the conserv conservation of the energy. So if you remember it, um, it will be very easy for you to learn this chapter because most of the concepts of the conservation of energy has been learned in my preparation lecture. If you don't remember that, please go back to the slides of energy and work to see what's the conservation of energy. And in this lecture, I suppose you have um, you have been very familiar with conservation of energy because we have spent a couple of weeks on that and we will briefly introduce the ideas of the conservation of energy in the form of the first law. Um, in the preparation lecture, when we learn this conservation of energy, we don't call this the first law of thermodynamics. Here we call it the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, a, thermo, a thermodynamic system is any collection of objects that may exchange energy with its surroundings. So for example, in this picture, uh, we can consider the pot, the lid, and the popcorns in the pot to be the thermodynamic system. And then in this thermodynamic system, the thermodynamic process, which is shown here, the heat is added to the system from the bottom. So this is a heat added to the system. And the system does some work on its surrounding to lift the lid of the pot. So Q flows or heat flows into the system and the system is doing some work uh, to move the lid. So this is a, a typical thermodynamic system. Now, let's see. For thermodynamic system, in the thermodynamic system process, um, the change occurs in the states of the system. Um, 
in the in the thermodynamic system, there's some heat flows. There could be some heat flows into or flows out of the system, and the system can do some work, or uh, the system can do some work to the environment, or the environment can also do some work back to the system. If the uh, heat, if the heat is flowing into the system, then we call this heat to be positive. If the system is doing some work to the environment, means the volume of the system is getting bigger, then we call this work is positive. In the opposite way, if the heat is flowing out of the system to the environment, we call this heat is negative. If the environment is doing some work to the system or the system is shrinking in its volume, then we call this to be negative work. Now, let's see uh, the work uh, has been done um, during the volume changes. So let's understand the work by a gas in volume change by considering a molecule in the, in the gas. Okay, so let's see. In this container, you have a lot of gas molecules because this is a container containing gas. So let's consider just one a gas molecule here. When one such molecule collide with a surface moving to the right, so the volume of the gas increase, for example, it collide with the uh, piston, the wall of the, the inner wall of the piston. So the volume of the gas increase and the molecule does positive work to the piston. Because when it hit, when the molecule hits the wall, it performs some force in this way. And if the uh, piston moves also in that way, that means there is a displacement uh, in the same direction. So the force and the displacement are in the same direction. That means um, the molecule is doing some positive work. So that's why when the volume of the system is getting bigger, then um, the system is doing some positive work to the environment. In another way, if the molecule is hitting the wall, it will perform a force in this way. However, if the volume of the uh, container is shrinking or the piston is moving in to the left, so the display, the displacement is moving to the left, then the force and displacement, they're in opposite direction. In this way, the molecule is doing some negative work. So the entire gas is also doing some negative work because any molecule which is hitting the piston has to perform a force in the direction uh, towards the right, but the piston is moving to the left, means the uh, volume is, is shrinking. So when the volume decreases, that means the system is doing negative work. Okay, so that's the explanation of positive work and negative work in the system. It's related to the volume. When volume is getting bigger, it's doing positive work. I mean, the system is doing some positive work to the environment. Okay. Uh, now, let's see the volume, uh, the, the work done during the volume changes, how to calculate it. The infinite small work done by the system during the small expansion dx could be calculated in this way. So now let's see this is the container. If uh, the volume of the container is getting a little bit bigger by moving the piston by a distance of dx, which is infinite small distance, then how to calculate the work that has been done to the environment? It's P A D X. P times A, the pressure times area, is force. Do you remember that? Force equals to pressure times area. And then F times displacement. 
is the work. What's the displacement? It's dx. So this is f, f times dx. It's the work that has been done uh, when the piston is moving dx. So in a finite change of volume from v, v1 to v2, uh, we can calculate the work still in this way. So still it's p a dx. So first let's from v1 to v1 to v2. So first look at uh, what is a dx. A is a cross area, dx is a uh, displacement, then a times dx equals to dv. That's the volume change of this part. That's this part of volume. So this equation can also be written as uh, an integral from v1 to v2, p times dv, which is here. An integral from v1 to v2, p times dv. That's the work that has been done to the environment from v1 to v2. OK, so the work done equals the area under the curve on the PV diagram. Because, um, let's say, um, in x-axis, the the x-axis is v, and the y-axis is p. So if you do a, a integral of p dv from v1 to v2, then actually you're calculating the area under the curve. So this is the definition of um, integral. So for any integral, it's the area under the curve. So shown in the graph is the system undergoing expansion with a varying pressure. OK, so that's a PV gram for gas. And then you can see um, the work done is the area in the red. And um, if a system is undergoing a compression with a varying pressure, then um, the V is getting smaller. So V is from V1 to V2, it's getting smaller, and P is getting greater. Then you will calculate the integral. So the integral is the still the area under the curve, but it's negative. Uh, I don't know if all of you have learned the um, uh, calculus. If you learn the calculus, you will know for integral, if you do the integral from left to right, it's positive number from left. To, if you do it from right to left, it's a negative number. And the, the, the value is the area under the curve. That's common for integral. If you're not familiar with uh, these two slides, um, I think the main problem is calculus. So here I will not go through the calculus again, but if you feel difficult, go back to calculus and see what's integral and how to cal calculate integral in the curve and area. OK, so here is another graph uh, in which p is constant. You see here from uh, v1 to v2, p is constant. Uh, if p is constant and the system is getting uh, volume from v1 to v2, then it's still an integral. But if p is constant, the integral becomes very easy. It's uh, It becomes p times v2 subtracted by v1, or p delta v. OK, now the work depends on the path chosen. Let's say uh, you have a two states, a state one here and a state two here for your system or a system of gas, let's say. So for state one, um, you have the, the system or the gas 
to be in the volume of V1 and the pressure of P1. And in the second state, you will have the volume to be V2 and the pressure to be P2. So that's the two different states. If you want to change the system from uh, state 1 to state 2, you have a lot of pathways. Here, we use three different pathways. Okay, the first pathway, we can um, change the system from P1, from uh, state 1 to state 2 by first doing the constant pressure uh, change. So, so if we keep the pressure to be the same, then the pressure is always P1 and change it to a state 3. And then once it's in state 3, let's change the states uh, from 3 to 2 in a constant volume um, um, way. So the volume is a constant, you change the pressure from P1 to P2. That's the first way. Another way is let's make it in a constant, for example, constant temperature. If it's a con con uh, constant temperature change for a gas, then the curve is something like that. We have learned it in last chapter. So a third way is we can change the system first in the constant volume uh, uh, method. So we drop the P1 to P2, and then let's change it from uh, change it in the constant pressure way or method. Then we change it in a constant pressure of P2 from state 4 to 2. So that's three different ways. However, you, you, you can have a lot of different ways. It not, it's not necessary to be a constant pressure or constant temperature or constant volume. It could be any way. So here we just listed three ways. So these three ways or paths give three different options um, from state one to state two and they result in different works so the first way we change the state from one to three to two it has a area under the curve very big this is the area so the system does a large amount of work under the paths one three two if we change it to another way the system did a small amount of work because if you calculate the area under the curve, it's a smaller area. And then for, uh, for the other way, which is constant temperature way, um, the work done is different from that either of the other phases. So here, using the three different methods, we know uh, the path of changing state um, could vary the work that has been done to the environment. And the change in the internal energy U of a system is equal to the heat added minus the work done by the system. Do you remember this equation? We have learned it in our preparation lectures, which is um, energy and work. So the first law of thermodynamics is just a generalization of the conservation of energy. We mentioned this conservation of energy again. If you forget it, go back to the preparation lecture of work and energy. Both Q and W, the heat and the work, depend on the path chosen between states. But delta U is independent of the path. So let's say um, from state 1 to state 2. If you choose different passes, um, the system will do different work. However, the energy difference between two and state 2 and state 1, it's the same, no matter which way you choose. So that's, uh, what, that's what it, it says here. Uh, if the changes are infinitely small, we can write the first law as du equals to dq uh, subtracted by dw. 
Okay. In the thermodynamic pro process, the internal energy U of a system may increase. In the system shown below, more heat is added to the system than the system does work. For example, if there are 150 joules of heat flows into the system and the system is doing some work, which is 100 joules to the environment, then it gets more heat than the work doing to the outside or the environment then the internal energy will increase by 50 joules in another way if <clears throat> uh, there's some heat flows out and there's some work has been done to the system and the heat flows out is greater than the work has been done to the system then the internal energy decrease in this example, it decreased by 50 joules. In another way, if there's some heat flows into the system, it equals the work has been done from the system to the environment, then the internal energy change is zero because they balanced each other. I think that's easy to understand. Okay. So now let's talk about some real examples like our bodies. Your body is a thermodynamic system. So when you do a push-up or some exercise, your body does work. So W is positive, means you're doing some work to outside or to the environment. And your body also warms up during exercise and then uh, that means your body is getting rid of the heat then Q is negative means your body is kind of um, losing some heat and those heat are transferred from the body to the environment since Q is negative means heat is getting out W is positive means your body is doing some work then U internal energy of your body must be negative and the body's internal energy decrease that's why exercise helps you to lose weight because you you're losing in the um, in um, internal energy we are losing internal energy it use up some of the internal energy stored in your body usually in the form of fat so uh, since we have been staying home for like a month, you know, why not to do some exercise at home? Maybe pause the video, do some push-ups or other uh, exercise, and then come back to the lecture. Just burn some energies or um, use up some fat. Okay, so internal energy the internal energy of a cup of coffee depends on its thermodynamic space state means how much water and ground coffee it contains and what is the temperature it does not depend on the history of how the coffee was prepared for example uh, how it was warmed up um, is it warmed by fire or it's warmed by some um, um, electricity um, coffee machine is it warmed slowly or is it warmed up quickly it doesn't matter the thermodynamic path that leads to its current state is uh, is not uh, does not matter so it doesn't depend on the history of the um, coffee how the coffee was prepared so it only depends on um, the thermodynamic states so here is a cyclic thermodynamic process of human day so you can see what did you do in uh, common day and uh, how much work you have done for example in dinner and how much um, uh, let's say heat you have taken or calories you have taken into your body 
So you need to make it kind of balanced. So the work has been done uh, equals to the heat or the calorie you take to your body. Otherwise, you will accumulate uh, energies in your body. Those energies will be accumulated in the way of your fat. So be careful, especially in those days you're staying home. So better to do some exercises to make your work flows out. Um, at least balance the food, um, the energy from the food. Okay. At the end, let's talk about four kinds of thermodynamic processes. This is four basic concepts. We don't have too much things to explain. There's no uh, much calculations in the concepts, but let's just understand or get the ideas of the four concepts. So there are four specific kinds of thermodynamic processes that occurs often in the practical situation. The first situation, adiabatic. So in adiabatic thermodynamic, no heat is transferred into or out of the system. So Q is zero. And uh, the because Q is zero, so the delta U or the change of energy is the work has been done. Uh, second, isochoric. In this type of thermodynamic, the volume re the volume remains constant. So there's no work down from the system. The third type, isobaric, in this type of thermodynamic, the pressure remains constant. And the last one, isothermal. In this type of thermodynamic, the temperature remains constant. So basically, there are four different types of thermodynamics. There are four classic, uh, or most common thermodynamic processes. Let's talk about uh, some details of the uh, adiabatic process. So for adiabatic process, it means there's no heat flows in or flows out of your system. So no heat exchange. So let's see one example here. When the cock is popped up uh, on the bottle of champagne, the pressurized gas inside the bottle expands rapidly and do some positive work on the outside air. And there's little time for the gases to exchange heat with their surroundings or environment. So the expansion is nearly adiabatic. So that means there is no heat change. There is no heat flows out or flows into the system, which means the bottle and the lid, the cock, and the, the air inside the bottle. So there is no heat change. Hence, the internal energy of the expanding gas decreases because it's doing some work to the environment then the temperature must change and the temperature must drop so this uh, makes water vapor condense and form a miniature cloud so you see it's like a miniature cloud because the temperature decreases suddenly okay another process the isobaric process. So most of the cooking involves isobaric process because um, the air pressure above, let's say a pan or frying pan or microwave is essentially constant. It's atmospheric pressure. So the pressure is constant while the food is being heated. So during this process, it's isobaric process. And here uh, shows the four process on the PV gram. So for example, if 
let's say uh, the pressure doesn't change, then uh, from A to 3, it's isobaric uh, process. And uh, if the temperature doesn't change, then here from A to 4 in this curve, I mean this curve, that's an isothermal curve. And also uh, you have uh, the curve for the other two types of process shown in this picture too. And now let's talk about the internal energy of ideal gas. The internal energy of ideal gas depends only on its temperature, not on its pressure or volume. The temperature of ideal gas does not change during the free expansion. And do you remember the heat capacity? Now let's talk about the heat capacity of ideal gas. Let's say Cv is a smaller heat capacity at constant volume. To measure Cv, we can raise up the temperature of ideal gas in a rigid container so that the volume of the uh, air is the same. And then um, the dq equals to n Cv dt. So dq is the heat you added dt is the temperature um, it rises n is mole and cv is um, the uh, molar heat capacity so using this way you can measure the heat capacity of ideal gas in the constant volume so another heat capacity is the molar heat capacity at constant pressure to measure this constant pressure's heat capacity what you can do is you can heat the gas and add a constant pressure to the uh, system. So when the heat is added, the temperature might be increased and the volume is getting bigger, so the piston is moving up. However, you can uh, keep the pressure of the gas to be a constant. Then when you can measure um, the heat you added in, the temperature that has been changed, and then you can uh, measure or do some experiment to get uh, the relationship between the heat, the temperature, and heat capacity at constant pressure, which is Cp here. Okay, so to produce the same temperature change, more heat is required at constant pressure than at constant volume since delta u is the same in both cases so why is that why cp is greater than cv um, if we look at this curve if we uh, look at the curve here let's say if we want to change the temperature from T1 to T2, T2 is a higher temperature, T1 is lower temperature. Let's say we start from here. If you want to change the temperature from T1 to T2, which is in this curve, in a constant, let's say constant volume, then what you can do is, this is a curve of constant volume, and the temperature has been changed from T1 to T2. And you can see from here to there, there's no work done. In another way, constant pressure. If it's constant pressure way, so it changes the temperature from here to there in this pass. And here you can see it has been done. Um, some work has been done. And this work is the area under this curve. So in constant pressure process, gas does some work, but in constant volume pr process, gas does no work. So that's why um, the constant pressure uh, heat capacity is bigger. It's bigger by a constant, which is a gas constant, and the volume is here. The ratio of heat capacity is showed 
uh, in this equation. For uh, monatomic ideal gas, for monatomic ideal gas, the value or the ratio is 1.67, and for diatomic ideal gas, the ratio is uh, lower. Okay, and let's talk about more about the adiabatic process. In adiabatic process, no heat is transferred in or out of the gas, so the heat is zero. And here, if we show it in a PV gram for adiabatic expansion, as the gas expands, it does positive work. So let's say for ideal gas um, from A to B, the V is increasing and pressure is decreasing as the temperature is getting lower. As the gas expands, it does some positive work on its environment. So the internal energy decreases and the temperature drops from here to there. Note that the adiabatic curve mm, at any point is always steeper than isotherm at that point. For example, from A to B, it's steeper than either uh, T1 curve or T2 curve. Okay, uh, exhaling adiabatic. So we all have such experience if you put your hand a few centimeters in front of your mouth and open your mouth wide and exhale, you will feel it's warm. However, um, if you purse your lips as though you were going to whistle and again blow on your hand in the same distance, what do you feel? The exhaled gas will feel much cooler in the second way. Why is that? Because in this case, the gas undergo a rapid, essentially adiabatic expansion as they emerge from between your lips. So the temperature of exotic gas decreases. So in the second method, it's a nearly adiabatic uh, process. So the air from your uh, mouth is getting cooler. It's getting much cooler than the first way. Okay, so that's everything for today's lecture. Um, I will see you on next lecture, which is lecture 20. Have a good day.